and now we are moving over to another very important keynote speaker a good friend of anna university dr ketina michel uh, she has been very nice working with us for so many years uh, dr ketina michel is a professor at arizona state university holding a joint appointment in the school for the future of innovation in society and school of computing informatics and distance systems engineering she is also the director of the society policy engineering collective spec and the founding editor in chief of the ieee transactions on technology and society katina is a senior member of the ieee and a public interest technology advocate who studies the social implications of technology she has held 14 annual workshops in the social implications of national security space national security space and chaired three international symposia on technology and society istas is a flagship conference of uh, ieee ssi the one in the, she has chaired three the such symposia wellagon toronto and phoenix she is the senior editor of the socio economic impact section ieee consumer electronics magazine and was the editor in chief of the award winning ieee technology and society magazine In 2019, she took on the role of the working group chair of the ITPE P2089 standard. In 2020, she received the ICTO Golden Medal for Lifetime Achievement Award for exceptional contributions to research and information systems, and the ITPE Phoenix Section's Outstanding Member contributing to the Global Humanitarian Projects Award for her contributions to a better understanding of the impact of emerging technologies on humanity. In 2017, she also received the Brian M. Opperman Society on uh, on the award on the so so social implications of technology, Distinguished Service Award. Thank you very much, Dr. Katina, for being with us so right from the inception of this series of conferences. It has been my pleasure interacting with you, learning from you that things have to be done with a lot more diligence than what we uh, what we normally think uh, we should be doing at, doing with. and i welcome you for your keynote address she was one of those who confirmed the keynote very very quickly very very soon the fast fastest confirmation for the keynote address which we have received for this conference however after noting a lot of things the conference committee is pleased to invite you now for the keynote address it's titled darpas adapter program applying the lc approach to a semi autonomous complex socio technical system nice topic nice lecture thanks for the paper um thank you for that very kind introduction and for the invitation uh, as a keynote which uh, is among uh, the dearest that i have received so far in my life uh, particularly because of the esteem uh, that the conference is held in commemoration of the works of the wonderful Norbert Wiener I want to challenge everyone today uh to read Wiener's books especially for those uh who have come to the conference in an indirect way uh to get out his books go to the local library uh get online see what you can find freely available in, in the public domain and begin to read his works I think it typifies the kind of um polymath and kind of fluency we require today in our transdisciplinary approach if we can put on the mindset of Norbert Wiener someone who was not only a brilliant practitioner theorist but also thought deeply about responsible innovation and today we have a domain of study called responsible innovation uh, and i believe he asked the most important questions at a time uh that change was ever present and we were on that precipice of going towards the digital and so his information science his information theory his uh knowledge of feedback loops his multidisciplinary and transdisciplinary work uh was so important that i think uh whenever i'm working on projects like this one that i'm presenting to you today i always think well what would norbert have done and quite possibly in this one he may have refused to actually engage in the project itself and so i don't want to sound like a hypocrite at the moment 
by uh, starting off with the great Norbert Wiener and then on the second hand saying to you, well, what would Norbert Wiener have thought? Quite possibly what he would have thought was this is a, a no-go zone. However, we don't know. Um, you read his books and make up your own mind about his views on conflict, his views on uh, bombs, his views on killing machines, his views on uh, things to do with weaponry. And he would put it to us as follows. Use your intelligence, that which was gifted to you and that which was developed by you uh, in the most appropriate way, but certainly not to maim or kill. Now, I say that because the current project I'm presenting to you seems quite passive. It's not about um, creating an atomic bomb. Uh, it's about helping war fighters during conflict. Um, as many of you would know in reading some of his work, uh, he was sidelined by many uh, of uh, the technological milieu of his time, um, ignored, excluded, and probably not given the honors he should have been while he was alive. Those mostly came after his death. So I'm applying the LC approach to a semi-autonomous complex socio-technical system. That's the presentation today. And the disclaimer that DARPA would like me to read out is I'm not an employee of the Department of Defense or the US government. The views presented are not the views of DARPA, nor the Department of Defense, nor the US government. Further, the activities are not endorsed, sponsored or promoted by DARPA, DOD or the US government. So that's the disclaimer. I'll also put a few more disclaimers in there that I have an affiliation with Arizona State University. Um, I have been part of the Society on the Social Implications of Technology since around 2003 from memory. I'm a member of the Australian Privacy Foundation since 2008. I have been awarded Australian Research Council grants and also National Science Foundation grants in the past. And I'm also on several boards of the IEEE, SSIT and the Council on RFID. Uh, I hold a chair's position in the IEEE uh, Standards Association for P2089, and I've also previously been a Consumers Federation of Australia representative, representing consumers on five uh, biometric standards. I've also consulted for uh, agencies and uh, private corporations like Booz Allen, and I have unpaid consultancy to the Australian government. So the abstract today is to look at the ethics the legal and social aspects or implications. LC is a term that's quite often used in the US and it was brought forth from the Human Genome Project. LSA is a term that's been used in the EU and the difference being LC talks about implications that are not yet to come perhaps and very hard to diagnose ahead of time, whereas LSA talks about the aspects we might interrogate the DARPA project we're looking at today is called Adapter. And it's a travel adapter for the human body, either as an implantable or ingestible. And my contribution to this project was as an unpaid LC panelist, of which there are four, I'm just one of them. And the paper is about whether it's desirable or permissible uh, for implants to be given to war fighters to achieve the goals of better sleep cycles and the diminishment of travelers' diarrhea. That's the two main aims of this project, to better sleep cycles, to get that circadian rhythm in the body working better. And we heard a talk three days ago at the conference here on this internal uh, biology and circadian rhythms. Uh, so better sleep cycles and the diminishment of travelers' diarrhea. So it's not the first time that DARPA has raised the potential for implantable devices. I reported on this back in the last Norbert Wiener conference in 2016, but it was in 2013 that they called for proposals for brain implants that might support ex-servicemen and women who had developed the debilitating post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, as a result of being to war. And so we take people to war 
and lo and behold they see conflict they participate in conflict and suffer from or have to live with the condition ptsd many of these um, observers and commentators of ptsd from wartime have commented how many people particularly in the last three to four years have suicided uh, and have also killed their own families as a result of the PTSD they have been living with. And those stories are gut-wrenching, there's nothing else to say. But one way to overcome these PTSD episodes, uh, which la last a lifetime for people who have been in conflict, is this introduction of a potential restorative active memory chip that would be a brain implant. We held a whole workshop uh, at the University of Melbourne as a precursor to the Norbert Wiener Conference. Um, that was, I think, the 14th or 13th uh, National Security Workshop I run annually. And so that day we had a number of people talking about the brain implants, the RAM project, the first brain implant project that was being suggested as a way to overcome PTSD. And this was to be given to ex-service men and women. And of course, uh, many have mentioned the neurophysiologist Arturo Rosenbluth uh, throughout this workshop and throughout this conference, in particular, uh, this third Wiener conference, about the human and machine, uh, the feedback loops in the brain, the importance of cybernetics, the importance of AI and statistics, the way we could create complex quantitative models to explore neurobiological and behavioral distinctions, and how to perhaps intervene in some of these issues that are felt by people. So there are many labs around the world that still uh, have been inspired by Norbert Wiener, of course, and many brain on a bench projects that don't actually dabble with real human brains, but simulate these brains. And I'm really thrust into thinking about Neuralink here as well. Uh, the Elon Musk initiative, of course, that many of us have heard about over the last two years in particular, though it's been around uh, in other forms for much longer. And the question that I pose in the paper is, what is the difference in mindset between Norbert Wiener and Elon Musk as well? There is a difference here, and I just want to point to some pictures. I don't think we've got footage of uh, Wiener laughing at really serious things. He's always depicted studying things carefully. And was, but when he was working, it was concentrating on uh, these huge theoretical problems he was solving in addition to really being circumspect. You know, there was none of this uh, looking at the camera and looking quite stupid or saying things that were silly. Um, it was always measured. And you can see the awe in his face over the potential. He knew how close he was to all of these amazing breakthroughs. He created them, you know, um, and he wanted to know how things would work. He wanted to postulate what could it do. He wanted to see what the possibilities were. But he had the right phrenema. It's not that he was uh, anti-innovation. He understood innovation for what it was, and I think he knew how to harness its power in the right way. So I point to a page from the IEEE Technology and Society magazine, uh, the society that runs this annual conference, sorry, this um, biannual conference, uh, and about 270,000 US service members since 2000 have lived with a condition of PTSD, and there are about 1.7 million civilians. This was at the time of 2017 in the US. But those numbers are rising today. For whatever reason, we have more and more people living with PTSD, and we can't really figure out why, apart from these traumatic uh, experiences, of course. So the RAM project was just one of many. And today I introduce to you the ADAPTER project. The Advanced Acclimation and Protection Tool for Environmental Readiness is ADAPTER. It's located within the DARPA Biological Technologies Office, DARPA slash BTO. ADAPTER aims to develop a travel adapter for the human body, an implantable or ingestible bioelectronic carrier 
that contains cellular factories and compounds, that is therapies, to be released upon secure external activation. So I want you to imagine a device like this that would trigger something in the human body via an implantable or ingestible device. So you either swallow it or you're implanted with it and you use a smartphone or some kind of hub device to tether to the implant. And that would trigger an external activation of the therapies. So imagine a soldier on deployment having the command and control to trigger a release of therapies to prevent particular conditions in their own body. Imagine they start to feel an onset of diarrhea uh, or they feel uh, that their sleep has completely been disrupted by jet lag or shift lag. So the system is designed to either entrain the sleep cycle, halving the time to reestablish the normal sleep pattern after a disruption, or to eliminate the top five bacterial sources of traveler's diarrhea. Consider a remote control capability to wellness and recovery. Adapter is a way to physically interface with the human body, a type of wireless living pharmacy via an implantable device that attempts to control the body's circadian clock, aiding to regulate cycles by providing accurate diagnostics and response mechanisms. So if we think about Wiener again, think about modeling all the rhythms and cycles in the human body and being able to tap into them in a way to control them, almost like a command and control from the outside in. So it should not surprise us that government agencies like DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, are heavily considering what the future might behold and soliciting proposals from cross-disciplinary technical research teams to ponder on one possible socio-technical imaginary this of a warfighter with an implantable device that has the edge. A future where implants are tethered to smartphones are commonplace and not the exception, but the norm. And the question I pose to all of you is, is this where we're going? Uh, MG Michael and I have written about this for over 16, 17 years. Uh, it was first recorded in my thesis. I began in 1997, but there were so many that talked about implantables before us, at least sporadically. So the question is, as DARPA attempts to see this project through in the next three years, a $30 million plus project, what will come out of it and potentially what may be commercialized? So we can't rule out anything, but at the same time, we must be sober in our analysis. One of the first questions I asked and presented was, couldn't we figure out this any other way? As a road warrior myself of many years, uh, I know when I was doing fortnightly long haul trips for 16 to 24 hour trips, um, I would often not use alcohol, not use drugs and use natural means to actually get myself on a better sleep pattern and make sure I wasn't gonna be feeling sick uh, otherwise. But of course that question was too complex. According to DARPA, the adapter program will develop a travel adapter for the human body an implantable or ingestible bioelectronic carrier that contains therapeutic cellular factories and biomolecules which can provide warfighters control over their own physiology. Adapter is multi-application and multifunctional. It uses an integrated system to house a variety of biosensors that will be diagnostic and interventionist, disrupting the typical medical supply chain that is lengthy in, pre in preparation and also in delivery. It will provide just-in-time antibiotic production and will be wholly embedded and performed in vivo. Adapter will allow for toxin removal from ingested resources and will provide the soldier on deployment with the ability to quickly acclimatize due to time zone differences the body is unmistakably exposed to after long haul travel. The whole point of Adapter is to overcome human physiological limitations during active operational service. The two priority areas for the military that have been identified are in training the sleep and eliminating bacteria from the body. So ADAPTA is not about altering the genetics of the human body, but working with the body to provide transient enhancement and extension of warfighter readiness. In this figure, we see how this will work in a proof of concept using an edge device an external hub, which is at the top of the person's arm. Interfacing with what's called the end train, 
the normalizing timing of rhythms across internal networks of circadian clocks implant. Each transfer, sorry, each transponder implant has a unique ID that will come with enough storage capacity to contain an encryption key for secure data transfer. It is believed that the implant will be embedded during an outpatient procedure into the subdermal layer of the skin and the insertion site will be the triceps of the individual as you can see depicted in this picture. The chip will be triggerable by the battery powered hub attached to an external form factor like a wearable armband or even luggable smartphone, depends how you want to actually roll it out. The hub will receive and transmit signals while tethered to a smartphone using a dedicated app that's secure. This is just one of several operational scenarios. An in-body device communicates with an on-body hub that are plausible for the future of implants previously described in so many other works. And we have many different operational scenarios. An implant that communicates with an onboard wearable device or an implant that communicates uh, with a tethered device like a smartphone or even a lamppost um, or even some other kind of hub device. Now, DARPA um, called on an LC panel after the fact. So it was post tender, uh, post agreement to the universities that are participating uh, in this uh, N-Train and Adapter project. Uh, four panelists were invited. There's a sem semi-annual program meeting that I get to go to twice a year. It's a full day program with about 100 people uh, that are on the call. Uh, I also signed a non-disclosure agreement, so I can't discuss anything that's not in the public domain or that is of a technical nature. So as I noted earlier, LC is um, really about finding out and interrogating a technological device or a new technological breakthrough using these principles, these three areas, ethics, law, and social implications. Else has been applied to the fields of genomics and forensics and nanotechnology, and it was coined by James Watson all the way back uh, at the Human Genome Project. Sometimes the LC approach and responsible research and innovation have often been considered ethics washing. Ethics washing is a term uh, that's used to describe um, when ethics is preferred to regulation and or lip service is paid to action uh, because a company or a government agency or defense force may have a technical ethics board that conducts fabricated or exaggerated practice to uphold standards and or professional ethics. Um, one of the famous cases of this was Sidewalk Labs by Google, often pointed to as an, an experiment uh, where Goodman and Powell's, for example, in 2019, uh, talk about what did we learn from this process and the board that they had elected uh, on ethics. So one way to ethics wash a project or a program is to invite panelists. That's the cynical part of perhaps uh, uh, one perspective. And the other side is to say, well, at least DARPA is engaging in this LC discussion and wishing for the technical personnel on the project to learn more about ELSA or LC aspects. However, we do know uh, and continuously we see that ethics doesn't go far enough, RRI doesn't go far enough. And the question that we have is how do we operationalize this process? How do we say these are the values that we espouse, these are the ways we wish to build our new technologies and to prove that those values have been embedded in the process of design. So let's interrogate for a few moments these three aspects and, and talk about the moral principles that govern a person's behavior or conduct of an activity, talk about the laws, the system of rules, which a particular country or community recognizes as regulating the actions of its members and how those things are enforceable by law perhaps or through other impositions like penalties and society at large, the social implications relating to society or its organization. And so if I wanted to summarize Elsie, it looks something like this. 
you could put against each one of these uh, circles themes or questions of a normative nature that would help you interrogate a particular artifact and the artifact often sits right here in the middle. On the bioethics panel, uh, sorry, on the ELSI panel, there's a bioethics scholar, a bioethics and humanities scholar, a health law policy biotech and bioethics scholar, and a public interest technology scholar. The criteria for our selection was unknown, although we were told uh, individually that uh, we were put in contact based on our research records. And the interdisciplinary technical teams, interestingly, note the term interdisciplinary. I don't think it's the same idea uh, that was postulated by the Macy conferences or by Wiener himself when he talked about the interdiscipline. Um, but we have a lot of technologists and engineers in these um, projects who are working on the end train, who are working on uh, the different kinds of uh, devices. Interestingly, we just had a presenter from Carnegie and next we have one from Rice. So I think it's quite pertinent that some of these major universities are engaged in this and to ask the question, how is ethics being understood in this process? How is law and society being understood in the way that uh, universities and institutes are tendering uh, for these kinds of projects? So 86% of the people on the project that is the doers of the project are male and 14% are female from observation alone of the photographs I was able to view. But we are talking about a potential open system here. A warfighter um, does work within a confine um, of uh, army personnel and divisions, and they are deployed to particular areas in the world. Uh, for conflicts or otherwise peacekeeping um, missions. But it's not like the person who has the uh, implant is not in an open system. They do have to cross international borders. They do have to cross um, outside their military base. Uh, and potentially they are at home uh, intermittently uh, during their service, whatever length of time that might be. But what happens to the implant post uh, their completion of their service is a good question and whether or not the actual individual will command and control that black box in a way that was not supposed to be controlled. So you can imagine uh, perhaps if there was a harmless substance uh, in the body being released to ensure better sleep cycles, I may want to sleep some more or sleep some less uh, and that could be activated by the soldier. A lot of these questions uh, haven't been asked but I know will be asked throughout the process of development uh, with thresholds. So these black boxes are not just um, AI black boxes on how this uh, uh, drug will be released in the human body, but they're also embedded technologies. These are the two types of uh, artificial intelligence slash autonomous system black boxes that uh, the TTS editorial, the Transactions on Technology and Society defined uh, not too long ago. And so when we're thinking about what this might look like on the individual, uh, here we might have a hub, an implant device, a wireless body area network, and then an ability to interrogate that. And this is just an example of a commercial product, the Vivo key that's been around for about four or five years, where an implantable device can be interrogated by a smartphone. So these things are out there uh, commercially if we want to find them. Uh, the take up is not, you know, in the millions, uh, but who knows when that point of time will come. Uh, we've seen a, a heightened awareness of techno solutionism during the pandemic outbreak for good reason. Um, and uh, these things are no longer conspiracy theories or to be relegated to just people dreaming up new innovations. And so I introduced the concept of socio-technics or socio-technical because while Norbert focused immensely on systems, he was aware of the broader societal implications. And socio-technical theory emerged from systems theory really, where we look at not just the uh, system itself, but the interplay of subsystems of the social. You know, we see that in the first sort of circle, 
the technical, and then the larger piece, the environmental that regulates the interactions between the socio-technical. We're also dealing with a device that's highly complex, semi-autonomous, and it's embedded. And this notion of ecosystems bringing together stakeholders to actually understand who are the major players? What do they contribute? Are we ready for something like this to be deployed? What could go wrong? And what kinds of safeguards have we introduced? And so the socio-technical for a moment, when we look at ELSI as a foundational conceptual approach and overlay the socio-technical, we can see that the socio-technical embraces two existing subsystems, the social and the legal, the social and the environmental. The ethical part is missing from the socio-technical, but often very much imbued in values. Um, and so the ethics sort of is an underlying, when we talk about ethics by design or ethical alignment as the IEEE um, P7000 series of standards have defined quite well, ethics is there as a value. So LC with socio-technical pretty much uh, will give us a very robust way to interrogate a new innovation that's more complex. And so we add the technical and the ethical, and here we have the program that we're interrogating, Adapter, but it's not just LC to me, it's also the design process. That's the way we can bridge together with the ethicists and the technical team. Now, depending on how, who you are, you'll see this in, in, in different lights. Um, are you an academy? Are you part of uh, a university that tenders for projects like this? Is part of your role as a professor, a researcher, to actually engage with um, these public funds so that you are able to acquire them and conduct research in a particular domain? Are you from industry? For example, BlackRock System, Microsystems uh, is heavily involved in this project. How do they dovetail together with the academic institutions to come forward with an approach uh, to satisfying the call uh, for DARPA? Are you part of the state? In this case, we have DARPA is a government entity. And uh, depending on who you are here, are you the media? Are you um, public? advocate of some, some uh, advocacy, uh, or are you part of an environment, a larger ecosystem, but where you sit in these subsystems will determine your feelings about the project and will create different challenges. I even go so far as saying the type of role someone has as a member of society, dovetailing again onto this um, quintuple helix model by Karyanis, uh, which was modified by uh, modified from the original uh, Eskowitz and Ledersdorf um, model, is talking about who you are. So if you're employed as an engineer at BlackRock Microsystems, you'll have a particular worldview. If you're a government employee working for the Defence Force, you'll have a particular view. If you're a member of a non-government organisation uh, on privacy, for example, you have a particular worldview. If you're an individual who contributes uh, to wireless systems standards, you'll have a particular view. If you're a government funded scientist, you'll have a particular view. If you're a program manager, if you're a for and not for profit, for example, looking at PTSD in um, warfighters, if you're an academic in other fields, if you're a patient who bears a brain implant device or will, will be the warfighter who will bear this particular end train one day, if you're a carer of a person, if you're a displaced person, if you're a person who belongs to an underrepresented minority, if you're a unique person with unique feelings, uh, you're all different types of people. Now, not to say that many of us don't wear multiple hats, we do. And so which approach to take is very interesting. And one of technological determinism, one of the social shaping of technology, one of praxistemology to say, you know, forget about theorizing what might be, forget about the precautionary principle or anticipatory ideas, we should just go with praxis, wait till it happens and then figure out what it means. Or are we going with a brand new approach with public interest technology at its very core? And this is where we start to look at transdisciplinarity. Norbert, probably influenced by his father greatly, given he was a language scholar, uh, that is the father, uh, 
really embraced interdisciplinarity. But there is this new transdisciplinarity trend, as was also mentioned by our previous speaker, Professor Pengaru, on transgener transgenerational approaches with the new Macy that he mentioned. I really encourage everyone to consider that into the future. I want to close, I have many more slides, but I'm gonna to jump to, I think this sort of conclusion slide, which is to look at the different um, challenges we have to meet when we do put this conceptual framework that embraces the socio-technical with the LC approach together. And we're looking at things like the absence of standards and guidelines. We don't have these yet. And perhaps it's premature to have them, or perhaps we should have already started working on them. This notion of access to data and access to one's um, embedded chip via the application, um, the assurance that the individual has the capability to determine what's released in the human body at what time, whether there is a remote kill switch involved, as many of these products actually have uh, that are on the market. Even if we look at things like Google Glass, there was a remote kill switch actually to the glass being utilized uh, when it was available for trial. Um, the personal values of the warfighter versus the military values and does a warfighter have a say when they enter the military? If they're deployed, is it a must have or is it an optional? Um, the soldier's rights and the citizen's rights. Uh, we often don't consider that citizens have a voice in this debate, but given it's taxpayer funded um, projects, I would suggest that we go very public and make this a, a public debate uh, where we look at the potentiality of what might be even for the commercialization of implantable devices, and then choice, care, the ability to audit, and this notion of embeddedness and in vivo. But still, I would say the majority of the world uh, does not have public awareness about this project. Um, as a concluding point, there are four or five takeaways. Um, one is that we often look at these different conceptual approaches and talk about the importance of STEM being influenced by the human and social dimensions. But I'm going to say that really the expert here is the warfighter. The people we should be consulting are the warfighters themselves, the end users, and even the community at large. And we often bypass these and we talk about the technical people, the, the the people who have the ability and the technical know-how, the engineering know-how, and leave everything to them to actually design the best uh, device possible. But I would say uh, we need to consult so many more. And I would say we often forget about the end user and we should be beginning with them, if anything. I also want to talk about the fluency. There was a big chasm between the ELSI panelists and the engineers, even though most of the ELSI panelists were engineers themselves. The more complex we get in our innovations, the more um, detailed people have to be in background to actually um, be able to contribute to a particular zone. But in going microscopic to a device, what we lose is the bigger picture. And so we need a plethora of people from a plethora of backgrounds engaged in this transdisciplinarity. I also want to continually ask the question, can we go back to basics? Uh, do we really need implantables? And everyone will have a different uh, perspective on that. And what is true engagement of an LC panel? Is it bringing in panelists after the fact? Is it embedding the panelists in the development of a design of a system? Or is it paying lip service? Fluency is very important as we work together, finding a common language in which we can communicate. And Norbert Wiener spoke about that so much. The, NACE, the Macy Conference has spoke about that. Ronald Klein has chapters on that in his books. And I encourage you all to read about those. And going back to the Blue Sky programs to conclude uh, my presentation in full, um, understanding the complexity and often complex systems um, can be quickly unraveled by very simple questions. And they don't have to be technical questions. Um, sometimes the engineering fraternity is in shock when simple questions are asked like, but what if, or when this happens, what do you do? 
or do we have this in place or have you considered this and that's where uh, a lot of the conversation has to take place where um, there's more and more complex systems are being introduced into society with even the most fundamental basic questions being left unanswered thank you thank you thank you very much dr katina michelle we are right on time